What's up guys, it's time for another mistakes video and to kind of mirror the top water video that we did last week, today we're gonna get really specific on one of our favorite top waters collectively here as a group and that's a frog. So we feel like this is a category that needs to be spoken about on its own because everything about it is a little bit different than say a walking bait or a popper and stuff that we discussed last week. So in today's episode, we are gonna talk about four key mistakes that we see guys make with frogs and hopefully it will prevent you from making them or maybe shed some light on some of the mistakes and if nothing else open up a conversation so we can all become better frog fishermen so if you want to talk frogs and hang out let's do it welcome to the hookup tackle the hookup tackle is the world's largest showcase of mega bass products featuring baits and colors not found at any other dealer the hookup also offers a wide display of OSP, Evergreen, Depths, Lucky Craft, Jackal, and many more. The Hookup Tackle is owned and operated by family, is staffed by guides and verified tackle nerds who love helping anglers elevate their craft. If you're in the Phoenix area, we'd love to have you stop by our showroom and check out the wonderful world of Mega Bass and the Hookup for yourself. If you shop online, there are almost 10,000 SKUs of Mega Bass products alone with hundreds of other companies and new products being added daily. So next time you're looking for that hard to find bait, that color your fish have never seen before, or maybe you just wanna elevate your game, look at thehookuptackle.com. Welcome back my friends. I am Ben with The Hookup Tackle, the Tackle Otaku on Instagram, being joined by frog fishing master, Jeffrey the King. Jeffrey the King? Ohio gazamas. Ohio. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. Good to hear. We're talking frogs today. Uh huh. Topic that you love. I like frogs. So, if you guys follow Jeff on YouTube or anything, you know that he's an amazing swim bait guy, right? But every time we go somewhere that's frog fishing related, the dude is chomping at the bit to throw it. So usually when we go out on the lake and we film, if it's a, a buzzbait episode or a crankbait episode or whatever, and they say, Jeff, you want to fish? Like, nah, dude, I'm good. I'm just gonna film, right? But when we go frog fishing, you're always chomping at the bit or when it's slow, you're always kind of picking up a rod and doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. So I can tell that you love frog fishing just like the rest of it. What is it about frog fishing that speaks to you? Well, growing up, it was, being able to throw a bait into that nasty stuff, because we have a few ponds locally here that are like very natural, so they have toolies, there's a lot of grass, and so you get to throw that frog in that stuff, and dude, it's such awesome bites, because it's straight braid, and it's just, like you said before, it's a boxing match, where you get that bite, and you set the hook, and the fish is trying to dig into the grass and get into the nasty stuff, you're trying to pull against it, and it's just so much fight and tension and man it's like, versus beast right basically yeah. and you're like i gotta get this fish out i gotta get this fish out and yep. what's great is the fish are normally of a larger grade fish too because they do agree. like to be in that in that nasty stuff for cover and shade and stuff like that so it's just really a fun way to get bites but i think there is going to be a few things that i learned from this that I, as a younger kid, I was doing some stupid shit with a frog. Of course, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> I mean, we all, look, we're all gonna do stupid shit, and no matter how much we know, we're still gonna do stupid shit. Yep. Because the reality is, as much as I would like to show up to the lake tomorrow and throw a frog start to finish and get like 150 bites on a frog, so I'm just like super in sync and just jacking them all day, how it usually works for me is I show up and I throw a frog for four and a half hours with no bites. Mm -hmm. And then the one cast that I stop paying attention or really being in key is the bite. Yeah, oh yeah. Right? And then, you know, instinctively, you you fuck it up. Oh yeah. Right? And you do some stupid shit. Yep. So hopefully today's conversation will just, will bring some stuff to light and please chime in on this deal as well. So I'm talking about something and, and you know, you feel differently about it, jump in there. I think, one of the questions we get asked all the time or we just talk about all the time is like, what's the funnest way to catch a fish, right? And <clears throat> for me, I think it's always torn between topwater and flipping, mm -hmm. right? You got that visual aspect of topwater, yep. but you have that just boxing match like you mentioned, flipping. Yeah. And I feel like frog is kind of like the blend of those <laughs> yes. two. Because it's kind of flipping yeah. most of the time when you're fishing heavy cover and big rods and heavy line, 
but you still see all the shit happen. Yeah, it's still so it's so sick, right? So it's literally to. I mean, it's hard to think of a better way to catch a fish than on a frog. So let's jump in. Today we're going to talk about four mistakes that we commonly see made, and each mistake we talk about is going to open up a little bit of a rabbit hole. So we're going to dive down through those and have fun talking about some stuff. So let's start out by talking about some actual baits so we can put our fingers on some stuff, okay? So, mistake number one that we see anglers make is not choosing the right frog, okay? So, what happens a lot and kind of mirroring what we were talking about uh, in last week's episode with the top water is a lot of times you pick something and you have success with it and you stay on that frog. And when they stop eating it, you just kind of chug it up to, oh, okay, they're not eating a frog today, right? So, for instance, Jeff, you and I earlier this year were out and we were shooting an episode and I was throwing a frog that normally they eat really good, yeah. a spro frog, mm -hmm. right? And I was getting bites and I was missing them and it would have been really easy to just say like, dude, they're just not eating it that well. Yep. But then the second we made a change and went to a different frog, it was down the gullet. Oh, they were crushing it. Right? So literally from one cast to the next, completely different response on the fish, right? So. The biggest thing that I'm trying to tell you is don't get too stuck on one particular frog. So I'm gonna talk about a few of our favorites in different genres, so that if you're just kind of getting started or looking for maybe some inspiration of something else to try, hopefully this will help, okay? So this is a Spro Bronze Eye Frog, and I pulled this out because I would say industry-wide, this is probably like the main frog that most people kind of start with probably the most famous frog on the market right <clears throat> not getting stuck in a rut is important for the style of frog but it's also important in the color of the frog as well so you know if you look at something like a spro and you walk over there to the spro wall there are literally like 742 colors of frogs like if you can imagine a color like there's even a color called orange juice right so I mean, if it is imagined, it's probably on a frog. But usually when you're talking about a frog, it obviously looks and acts and floats and moves at the same place a frog naturally would in nature. So it's pretty normal to think about buying a color that's going to look like a frog. But keep in mind that not every time you're catching them on a frog are the bass eating frogs and all of a sudden, boom, Oh, cool frog that I've been eating, right? Sometimes they're eating shad. Sometimes they're eating bluegills. Sometimes they're eating baby birds, right? And a frog, even though it looks like a frog, is not necessarily just mimicking a frog. You could throw something that's, you know, black with a little bit of a yellow head, and it looks like one of those little baby black ducks that they might be eating, right? You could throw something that's white, and it might look like a shad or a bait fish that they're eating right? So don't be afraid to experiment with color, okay? That's the first thing. Second thing is don't be afraid to experiment with the actual frog itself. Now, this is a walking style frog that's going to have a completely different movement to it than, say, this walking style frog, right? So this is a jackal gavacho frog, this is a frog that we all talk about a lot because it's one of our favorites. I'm not a huge, like, I don't have a lot of Jackal products in my arsenal, but they make amazing frogs, right? So all of their frogs are in my arsenal. So here's a Gavacho, here's a Bronzeye. Now, are they really going to eat this one instead of this one? Yeah, sometimes absolutely. And sometimes vice versa. Sometimes they're gonna eat this one instead of this one. They're gonna both move different. Right? They're going to have a different walk. They're going to have a different glide or a rock to them. And sometimes those little subtle differences can make a huge, huge difference, right? So walking frogs, you're going to want to grab yourself two or three different styles of walking frogs. So some of our favorites, obviously the Spro Bronze Eye is a staple, right? So you should get yourself some of this if this is a frog that you want to do. Now, just a quick note, if you get a Bronze Eye, you're gonna probably want to bend these hooks out a little bit, right? Because out of the package, it's not the best 
hookup ratio frog on the market. So bending them out is going to improve your hookup ratio. Some of these other ones, if you buy a, a really more of a premium frog, you kind of just take it out of the package and, and go with it. But feel free to tweak these if you want to cut skirts or move hooks or whatever. It's your frog. Do whatever you want to do, right? But I'm just going to highlight some of our faves. So the Jackal Gavacho, of course, that's an important one. If you need to downsize, the Jackal Kara frog, you'll hear Griff talk about this frog a lot. Uh, this is a great one because it's a much smaller profile frog, but it still weighs half an ounce. So it's still gonna cast well, but it's a much smaller overall profile frog. One of my favorites is this guy, the Mega Bass Big Gabbit. This is a larger frog. So you're going up to a three quarter ounce frog without it being too huge. But again, this is gonna be one that I can throw maybe through really thick cover. So if there's a big tule berm and I need to really get that frog back in there, I need to skip and have that frog have some momentum to it, the Big Gabbit's amazing for that. If it's a little bit more open water and I don't need to penetrate cover so much, then something like the Gavacho frog is a great option. Sometimes I might even go with like a single hook frog. So there's a frog like uh, the Evergreen Kicker frog, right? And this is also a great one when you need to skip it back in things and you're concerned about those two hooks on the side, maybe snagging a tule or catching grass as it moves, you can go with a single hook frog and that will eliminate it snagging anything it's around. So you can really get it back into some gnarly stuff. And the hookup ratio is actually pretty amazing on a single hook frog, almost better in my opinion. They make crawler style frogs. So if you want a frog that you can just kind of cast out and retrieve, so it kind of crawls the same way a, you know, like an NZ crawler or something would. It's got a built-in action to it with those little legs. You've got the Depths of Bassarisky frog. One that I never leave home without is this guy. This is the Depths Buster K. Now, you're gonna look at some of these frogs and you're gonna think, well, that's a popping frog, right? So, yes, <clears throat> Looks like a popping frog, both of these, the Gavacho and the Buster K. So you see the mouth is much more cupped, right? And you can use these as a popping frog. So you can throw it out there and just kind of pop it and it will pop. But all of these are designed to walk. They're all designed to go side to side and we'll talk about walking here in a minute. What I love about the Buster K is internally, even though this is very small, so for instance, here's a Kara frog, which is super popular in a Buster K. So not a huge size difference here, right? The difference is the Buster K has an internal weight transfer. So you can hear it shift. So when you go to cast this, that internal weight transfer makes it fly like a bullet. You can throw this thing so far. Uh, it's an amazing frog. Now, there are also times when they don't want you to walk that frog, right? There's times when they want it more of a straight retrieve, or maybe you're fishing different styles of water. So everything we've talked about so far has been more like heavy cover, putting it across a weed bed or into toolies or, you know, pitch it into a big tree. Sometimes they'll get over kind of open water. So if you think of like a grass flat, sometimes there'll be like some matted grass and an open hole and then matted grass and an open hole. And it's hard to throw something like a buzz bait or a plopper or a treble hook bait in there because the treble hook's gonna constantly snag on that grass. But you could throw something that's got a tail on it. You could throw like a sprinker frog or a drippy, something that's designed to be kind of like a buzz bait or a plopper, but in a hollow bodied frog. So this can be a great option. Tekel also makes the clinker. It's just kind of like a wake bait. So this is more of like a just run the bank, kind of open water frog and OSP makes a spin tail that kind of does the same thing. So this can expand your area that you're frog fishing, but it also expands your bait option. Now, I'm not saying you need to go and buy 422 frogs. Dude, if frog fishing is your thing, go buy all of these because each one is going to be a tool in your arsenal that's going to get you different bites that you're not getting on the other ones. But the biggest thing is, is don't get too stuck on one frog. If you've been catching them on the Gavacho, and you've been catching them on a bluegill gavacho, you know, day in and day out, and all of a sudden you get there and it's like, man, they should be eating it, but they're not. Maybe a switch to a natural frog or a white. If you notice there's bait flickering, maybe go to white. If it's a darker day, maybe go to a black or something like that. And maybe the color is all you need to do, but maybe they're just shying away from it. And by switching to a big gabbit or a Buster K or something else, gives you just a different look that allows you to increase 
your bites and extend your season. So choosing the right frog and not being afraid to choose something different, that's number one. All right, mistake number two that we make is not walking the frog properly. And this is the hardest thing that you're gonna learn getting into frog fishing is how to make a frog walk, right? So let's grab one here. <clears throat> so inherently, if you take a frog, any of these frogs, out of the package and you cast and you throw them, they're basically, they have no real built-in action unless you get a frog, you know, like a Sprinker or the Basariski. These are built to just cast and retrieve, right? So they've got a tail on the end that's gonna plop or churn or they've got, you know, something on it that's gonna make it move. But when you're talking about a traditional walking style frog, you have to impart the action into these the same as you would if you're buying a walking topwater bait. If you're buying a super spook, you're buying a diamante, you're buying a gunfish, you have to give that bait the action, otherwise it just doesn't do anything, right? Now, if you're fishing a gunfish, kick knocker, a traditional walking topwater bait, those baits are longer, okay? And your motion with your rod is kind of a a little bit harder of a jerk to make sure you're picking up the line and you got to move that whole bait so if you're throwing a kick knocker that's this long for instance that whole thing has to be moved hard enough to shift the whole thing right well when you're talking about a frog usually they're only a couple inches big so if you give it that same walking motion that you're giving your walking topwater baits you're kind of giving that a hard rod jerk well you're you're pulling it too far now because you're trying, you're giving it the same movement that you would something that's say four or five or six inches, but your bait's only two. So when you jerk it, all it can do is kind of go down and back up, right? So if you're throwing a frog and you're trying to walk it and all it's doing is kind of porpoising up and down, right? It's kind of just doing this kind of motion. It's because you're pulling too hard. You're jerking too hard. You're doing the same walking cadence that you were doing on your kick knocker, your gunfish, etc. right? So the shorter the bait you go, the tighter your motion has to be on the walk, okay? If you choose the right rod, and we'll get to gear here in a second, all this should be, when you cast it out, all this should be is literally just a tightening here of the pinky, okay? So let me stand up, Jeff, just so I can get it in frame, because I want people to be able to see this. So if I'm throwing a kick knocker, right? I make my cast, I throw out there. My movement is kind of this pretty exaggerated, I'm using the rod to really kind of pull that bait and give it a good walk, right? If I'm throwing a frog and I'm trying to get it to walk, I make my cast, and instead of a big exaggerated movement, all I'm doing is I'm just kind of flexing my pinky. Okay, you can see how much smaller that rod motion is gonna be, okay? And all I'm doing is I'm just getting that tip to just real small, just a few inches at a time to move that bait. Now remember, 100% of the time, I'm gonna be throwing this on braid. So the line's gonna have no stretch to it. So any rod movement that I make is gonna really be almost instantaneous to that bait, okay? So the importance of this is if you can control it here in your hand by just kind of getting used to a certain movement, and you can, you can try harder pinky movements or softer pinky movements depending on the size of your frog, this will give you a lot of control because you can be very consistent. You can consistently walk it from the end of your cast to the front of your cast. Now what that'll do is because the movement is small and you're only pulling a few inches of line, that's perfect. Every time you move that pinky and that line pulls, that bait moves and you push your pinky again and that bait moves. And that's what you want from these frogs. There are times when you can throw it out there and just kind of pull it hard and just have it kind of do this like porpoisey thing that they'll eat it. Like they're super fucking juiced if they're eating it like that. Like they really want something just kind of floating on top of their head if they see this and want to eat it. But 99 out of 100 times, if you're going to catch them good on a frog, that frog needs to be moving side to side right? And that's the key. So jerking too hard and not having the right cadence is, is critically important to work on. And it's just time on the water. You're, you're all going to just have to work through it. But if you can get to the point where you just kind of move that pinky to get that rod to just kind of push it, 
your bite ratio is gonna go sky high, your frog's gonna walk great, and you're gonna catch a lot more fish. So that's number two, is making sure that you can walk a frog effectively. Okay, number three mistake we see guys make with a frog is not having the correct gear. Okay, so I'm gonna touch base on gear very quickly so you guys can understand what really you're trying to get when you're talking about a frog setup, okay? So, <clears throat> let's start with rod and reel, or let's start with reel and line. We'll go back to rod because I, I feel like the rod is probably the most critical part of all of this is having the right rod, and it's the one that we get questions on the most. But let's start here with reel and line. So, on the line, you're, you're probably 999.9 .9 times out of a thousand, you're gonna wanna use straight braid. I have been on bites with a frog before where I've thrown it on floor, okay? And there are times when if you guys are fishing, for instance, maybe just some nasty, gnarly wood jams, like maybe you had a flood and you've got a bunch of wood just stacked up and the fish are underneath that wood, a lot of times throwing braid across that can be detrimental, especially if you're having to make a long cast because the braid has a tendency to slice into wood. So I have been on bites before where I've needed to throw fluoro just to prevent it from digging into the wood. But that's so obscure and so rare that I hate to almost even talk about it. But don't be afraid to try different things if you need to. But almost always straight braid is going to be the answer. And we don't do a leader, we go straight braid to the frog. You want this solid, solid connection, right? For me, the heavier the braid, the better. Okay, and we we talk about this a lot when I talk about braid. I'm a huge fan of like 60, 70, 80 pounds. That's kind of where I live on a frog. I find that it digs the least in my spool. It gives me the best castability. It's obviously ultra strong. So if you're trying to pull fish out of a, a, a huge clump of grass or a gnarly tree or something like that, the stronger the line, the better, right? Plus it's a little bit bigger and it's a little bit more resistant to wind. So a lot of times you'll be fishing and the wind will be blowing down a bank and if your line's too light, it'll get, it's just easy for that line to kind of drift away where the thicker line has a tendency to be a little harder to drift. So you're gonna get a little bit more consistent walk out of your frog as well. So I, there's zero cons for me on going heavy, a lot of cons in going light. So make sure when you grab your braid, if you're, if you're looking for a good line, go with heavier. Now, if you're throwing it on lighter and you're having success, then stay lighter. Don't change because I said to change. But if you're, if you're struggling, the heavier you go with braid, the easier it's gonna be to use, right? But obviously there's a cap to that. I don't know if you go to 400 pound braid, you're gonna be able to cast it. But if you stay in that 60, 70, 80 pounds, somewhere in there, that tends to be perfect. On the reel, you're gonna to wanna to go high speed. Eight to one for me. The higher, the better, just because everything is, is you're, it's just like flipping. You're pulling them out of cover right? So you want to be able to catch up to them and have as much control as possible. Now there is a ceiling to that as well, right? The reel needs to have strong gearing because again, you're pulling them out of cover. So going to a 10 speed, 10 to one or an 11 to one, if the drag is weak and the gearing's weak because they needed to weaken it to get such high gear ratio, you're defeating the purpose. So you want it to have a strong drag, strong gears, high gear ratio, usually an eight to one is perfect for that. Now, let's jump over to rod. What is it that you're looking for in a rod? Here's the biggest thing I can tell you. Here are the two rods that I personally use all the time this is a TS Destroyer Poker, this is a D74 AGS. These are my, this is my kind of one, two punch frog combo. Both rods are relatively similar. What you want is you want a rod that's going to have just a little bit of give at the tip, okay? So you don't want it to be too soft up there. You want it to bend just a little bit and then the rest of it to be backbone, okay? Because at the end of the day, after you're connected, you're hauling fish out of cover. So it's almost like a flipping stick or a punching rod that you need to think of, but the tip needs to be soft enough to where you can still present a cast accurately because you're taking 
a small little bait and you're trying to put it in very key specific little holes or skip it up underneath a tree. So the rod needs to give enough to where you have a little bit of cast control, but it needs to be strong enough to where you can jack them out, right? So as you're looking at frog rods and what makes a rod quote unquote frog rod, here's the steez, right? Is that the rod has just a little bit of give and it's kind of a little slower give, I would say. Wouldn't you, Jeff? It's not like a super fast tip like you would get in like a jig and worm rod. It's kind of more of a, a slower taper at the tip so that it graduates to power and you get to that power uh, to haul those fish out. Now, this is ideal situation. Word of caution, if you're just starting, if you get a true powerful frog rod, it's gonna be relatively hard to get used to walking because everything happens so fast because there's not really a lot of forgiveness. You're gonna to have to make sure your timing is good on your cast. You can make sure you're, you're actually doing that little technique where I'm telling you to just kind of flex your pinky on the walk so that rod is just using that little bit of tip to give. If you're just struggling to walk into cast, you could go with a softer rod. Like we sell a bunch of like Mega Bass Orochi Perfect Pitch, for instance, right? Uh, or Steez 72 Heavy, where you've got a lot more tip section, right? The more tip you give yourself, the easier it's gonna be to cast, the easier it's gonna be to kind of get that frog to walk. But when you go to set the hook and yank on them, it's gonna also bend deeper and you're not gonna have that same leverage or power, right? So this is kind of a, you're gonna have to decide what you need out of a rod. If you're fishing more open water with something like a sprinker frog or something that's more of like a buzz frog, then you could definitely get away with one of these softer type rods and it'll be good because it'll be loaded when the fish strike and you'll be instantly into the backbone. But for heavier cover and true frog fishing, I really think you've got to get your timing down with these faster rods is really going to improve everything for you and you're going to love using it. Okay. So choosing the right gear, that's number three. Okay. <clears throat> number four, probably after all of that, right? We figured out the right frog. We got the right gear, right? We've got all our stuff dialed where things derail the most is fucking up the hook set. Right? And this is probably getting back to what you were talking about earlier, Jeff. These are probably things that you buffooned as a kid. Oh yeah. Right? You got the bite and you yanked and the frog went flying. You're like, fuck, I just, I spent three hours to get something to eat and I just, I just screwed it up. Mm -hmm. Right? This is where things go wrong a lot. Now, let me preface by saying every type of bait is going to have either a higher land ratio or a lower land ratio than other types of baits. There are certain baits that just inherently based on the type of bait, you're gonna lose some fish, right? Like we watch you when you throw in a big glide bait, you know, you are you hit them and you got that net so fast and so often, dude, the fish comes off in the net and the bait goes flying and the fish is in the net. Like there's just inherent in a big bait that they're gonna be hooked in weird places, right? And stuff's gonna go wrong. Is kind of the same with a frog. You have a bait that fish are gonna come up and they're gonna suck and they're gonna go back into cover and maybe they suck and go this way, maybe they suck and go this way, maybe they suck and go, who knows where they go, right? So, and then they're in strong cover and everything is happening so fast. Like there's a lot of things that can go wrong on a hook set and landing a fish, right? So understand that no matter what you do, you're never gonna be 100% but the goal should always be to try to get as close to 100% as you can. And when you're not 100% and you're losing things or things aren't going right, let's analyze that and try to figure out if there's a way to fix it to increase your percentage, right? So let's talk about proper hook sets. And before we get into that, let's talk about the build of frogs and why this is important. So we'll see a lot of times when people come into the shop, they'll grab a frog off the wall and they'll get it and they'll look at it and they go, oh, it's a cool looking frog. And you see them do this and like squeeze and you're like, oh man, there's not a lot of uh, gap there for that frog, right? And we've talked about this before. If, if you're fishing for a snakehead or something that's actually coming up and like biting the frog, then this could be something important 
that you might want to do. But that's not how a bass eats a frog, right? If this thing is on the surface, a bass eats it by sucking it in. And that thing is down in its belly, right? It's in its crusher, hopefully, instantly, right? It's down there. So what's more important than this is understanding maybe this, maybe sideways. Like how much gap is there when I actually set this hook? Because when this is here and that fish is pulling away and you're pulling and that thing is going this way, that frog is actually bending in that fish's mouth as you're setting the hook. So, you know, checking to see what kind of gap there is on the side, checking to see and understand like, well, is this the type of frog that's designed for this hook to rotate out? Right? So there's a lot of frogs that are designed like this, where that hook is designed to rotate out. So that fish has gone down, he's pulled it down, and when you swing and set that hook, that hook is designed to rotate out and hook them like this. And then there are other frogs like the big gabbit, for instance, where that hook is solidly in there. It's actually kind of siliconed in, right? Where now you've got like some silicone on there. So that hook's not designed to come around. It's actually designed here. Like this would be the right way to check this bait. So they had to custom build this hook with a longer spear on the front to prevent it from having to twist. Right? So every frog is built a little bit differently and understanding the type of frog you have is going to also be important on understanding what type of hook set you need to have, right? So first off, go with that. If you're looking at a frog and you're trying to figure out, is it right? Is it not right? Do you need to bend the hooks, whatever, you know, squeeze it in different areas and understand how that hook is supposed to rotate. Now back to the bite. You get a bite, right? You spent all day, you finally put it in there. Right? It's so hard not to just swing. It's so hard not to just yank on that motherfucker, right? So you have to teach yourself some patience. It's gotta be a whoosh, and you almost have to like bow to the fish and then come back and crack, right? So you've gotta give it just a slight hesitation to allow that fish to come up, eat that frog. Now remember, he just came up and ate and depending on where you're fishing, he might have a mouthful of water. He might have a mouthful of weeds or lily pads or grass or other nasty shit in his mouth, right? He needs to be able to turn and exhale out his gills so that that frog is actually back in where it needs to be and then you hook him, right? So. The hook set should be solid, it should be sharp, it should be fast, but you need to give it just a second. So the biggest thing I can recommend doing is just think to bow to the fish. That's the easiest way for me to think it. However you need to do it is fine. If you're good at just whoosh, and then just waiting and counting like one, two, three, boom, crack, right? Great. But for me, it's whoosh, bow, then come back and crack, okay? so. Are you going straight up and down? Are you going left and right? A lot of it's gonna depend on how that hook is positioned in the frog. And a lot of it's gonna depend on where you need to pull that frog or that fish from, right? So if you need to set the hook and get the fish coming a certain way, then crack it to the side. If you need to set the hook and get them to come up, then crack it up and down, right? So there's not necessarily a 100% right and wrong way of doing it it's whatever's working and whatever you need it to do. So if you're setting the hook to the side and you keep missing them, then stop doing that. Go up and down. If you're going up and down and you're missing them, go to the side, right? So you've got to try to figure out where in the process you're going wrong and adjust it, right? It might be giving them more time even. It might be having them come up and swirl on it and whoosh. Now crack. Right, so you might give them three or four seconds even if you have the patience to do it before you crack it, right? So the biggest thing is you've gotta just make sure you don't have that impulsive instinct jerk, right? Boom, 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 walk, 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 whoosh. Eats, bow to the fish, give them a second, come back and crack on. And this is another reason why going straight braid is critically important 
because a lot of times there's gonna be a little bit of a slack line hook set involved here. And if you've got a fluoro or a mono leader tied on there, you're gonna bust it off every time. So again, by going to the heavy braid, it's gonna be a little bit more forgiving. If you do do a slack line hook set and it pops, it, sh it should hold up. You tied a good knot, you got a good line, you got the right rod, you're gonna be able to pull them out. So getting the right hook set and waiting for the right time to set the hook, that is number four. All right guys, so that is a wrap. Those are four mistakes and four little mini rabbit holes to dive down. Did we cover everything, Jeff? I thought so. Okay. And did you learn a lot from oh, your sensei? Of course I did. Okay. You're amazing. I know. But tell me again, what? Uh, you're amazing, sensei. Yeah. You're welcome, motherfucker. <laughs> All right, hopefully that was informative. Hopefully that will help. Maybe something we talked about, put a light bulb off, and you're like, ah, that's what I did wrong, right? But there's a million things that could go wrong anytime that we are talking about close range, high impact. So many possibilities come into play here. So if there's something that we didn't talk about that you guys have discovered in your own fishing uh, that you've been able to write the course and fix, drop it down below. Cause I, I want to share as much info as we all can collectively so we can all grow and be the best frog fishermen we can be. So uh, Jeff will leave links to some of these products if you wanna check them out. And of course, if you have questions on any of the frogs, the gear, anything that we covered, right? Drop it down below also and I will get to it. And guys, on behalf of myself and Jeff and everybody here at the Hookup Tackle, we know time is important. We really appreciate you giving us time to watch these videos. Thank you for the support. Thank you for your business and we will see you again soon. Enjoy frog fishing. Still a little bit of time left, a little window left before it gets too cold. So enjoy it. We'll see you again soon. Peace, my friends.